gas training, boiler, fault finding. My name's Alan Hart and today I'm back at Viva Training Academy. I'm back here with Roy, the expert trainer here. And Roy's gonna go through some faults on this boiler here. So, uh, so Roy used to be a Batsy trainer for many, many years. So he's an absolute expert on these boilers. Today's video is gonna go through the fault code E110 and show you how to test it and, and what, what it might come up as a fault on, on the boiler as well. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's go over to Roy. Thanks Al. Hi guys, it's Roy Fugel here at the Viva Training Academy over in Halifax. And today we're gonna to have a look at uh, some fault finding. Um, error codes, what happens when there's an error code? When does an error code occur? There's times when you'll turn up, the customer says the boiler's been locking out, they've been getting error codes, you'll walk in, the error code won't be there straight away. It's all about taking time. Sometimes customers exaggerate, sometimes they don't tell you everything. Again, it's interpreting what they say. So the complaint today, we're looking at this Potterton Assure. It's the same as the Baxi 600, Baxi 800 range, the main Eco Compact and they've rebadged up the pot to ensure the new Baxi Assure. It's all the same boiler internally, so we're going to be focusing on this boiler today. So the complaint we've had from the customer, the boiler's running all the time and it's got an intermittent error code. So as we can see, we've got the uh, tap symbol and the radiator symbol and it's sat there at about 30 degrees. We've got both controls set to maximum, but at the moment we've no demand. So the first thing is, let's see if we can get it to do this error code. Now this is where some people make a bit of a mistake and I'm gonna talk you through. So I'm gonna stick the hot tap on. So the first thing we're doing is looking to make sure the tap symbol flashes. So we know we've got a hot water demand. So the hot water is running, it's not flashed up an error code. So what do we do? Do we wait, do we carry on? Do we think the customer's telling us fibs? 90% of engineers I come across at this stage you go, well, it's not lighting. So I'm going to turn off and I'm going to start looking at the gas side of it. I'm going to start making sure, because it's not going to light and it takes five attempts to light. Now, just to go back a little step, it's all about health and safety. So we're in the academy, so I know for a fact if I turn the power off, put the fuse, do me safe isolation, I know it's killed all the power. Out in the field, remember safe isolation, TB118. I know me and Alan keep batting on about it, but we do, it's all about health and safety. I've got my gloves on. I know in a previous video, I went halfway through with my gloves and I took them off. Um, again, I'm quite used to working on these boilers. I know where the sharp edges are on anything, but yeah, out there in the field, be careful guys. So I've tried the hot water, it's not thrown up an error code. So the next thing is put the heating on. So this boiler's wired up through an EPH Combi Pack 4. I know a lot of you guys out there use them. We've actually got the, uh, the signalling wired up on open therm on this one. And quite simply, we've got it on uh, off. So I'm just going to pop it onto manual. So we've got the little signal now to tell it to, that it's communicating. And we've got the little radiator symbol flashing. So we know we've got a, a central heating demand. So it's going to go through a cycle for central heating. But very similar to when we turn the tap on, it's not doing anything, there's no error code coming up. So again, this is at the point where some guys out there would be rushing in and they'd be going, oh, it must be something to do with the gas, must be something to do with, with ignition. Let's start looking at all that. Now, one of the problems I found out there as a manufacturer's engineer and as a trainer in the past is getting phone calls from guys and I don't mind people ringing me up and asking for my, my advice, my opinion. Um, I'm always there to give it. Uh, I've changed this, I've changed that, I've changed the other. They've changed three or four components and it's still not working. And they're at the wit's end. It's all about taking time. I know sometimes you might not have the time. You've six or seven jobs booked in, time's money, you want to get out there. Right, we've given it a few seconds now and we've actually got an error code come up. So we've got E110 come up. So we've got an E110. We've got a little flame symbol with a cross in it, that's indicating that the boiler's not going to fire. And the little R symbol, which means it's due to be reset. So what we'd do, if we're not sure what the error code is, we'd have a look in the instructions. So we've got a set of instructions, and we've got the error codes 
down here. So we're going to have a look at the error codes. Now, for those that know me, I need to put my specs on. I can't read without them. So the E110 safety thermostat operated. And if we look across, E110 indicates overheat of the primary system water. Well, hang on a minute. It's not even fired up. So you might be thinking, well, how can it overheat if it's not fired up? So we need to investigate that. So that's what we're going to start having a look at. We're going to start investigating that circuitry. The reason it didn't come up straight away is a lot of modern boilers now, what they try to do is protect themselves. So they try to run and they'll try before they lock out to actually try to, to go through a sequence. That's why when we first turned it on and we put the demand up, we didn't get the error code coming up. So the next stage is to whip the front off and have a little investigation. Right, so I've now got the front off the boiler. I need to be going into the electrics. So I've done, um, pop the fuse, it's in my hand, it's in my pocket, so that's not going to go anywhere. So referring to the uh, fault finding guide, it says central heating follow operational sequence. And if we get down about a th oh, third of the way up from the bottom, it says E110 flashing, yes, go to section H. So I'm going to go to section H. So if we go around to section H, the first thing it says is safety thermostat operated or faulty. Yes. So I need to be checking the overheat stat and it's telling me to check for and correct any system faults. Well, I know that this system was only fitted a couple of weeks ago, so there's no faults on it. We know the pump's running. We know that it's circulating. We know everything's okay. So we'll go no for that. It then says allow to cool. Well, it's not fired up, so it is cool. Continuity across uh, thermostat terminals more than 1.5 ohms. So we're now going to be checking the overheat thermostat. If it isn't, it's telling me to check the flow and return sensors, refer to another section. If it is over 1.5 ohms, I'm going to replace the safety thermostat. So the next thing is, I'm going to get my multimeter and I'm going to go across those terminals. But when we're testing, obviously, safe isolation, safe isolation. The thing with overheat stats, some of them can be on low voltages, some can be on high voltages. So 240 volts, obviously, is serious. Anything over 50 volts has got the potential to give you serious injury. In fact, it can kill you. So always make sure we've covered safe isolation. I know I keep talking about it, I keep harping on about it. Another thing is to make sure I don't get any, any false readings. Always disconnect the component when you're testing them. It doesn't say so in the instructions, but if you're testing things like thermistors and gas valves where you're going to get a resistance reading in there, if you've still got them connected, you might get a false reading. It might not give you the right reading. So the next stage is I'm just going to drop the front to give me a little bit more access. And I'm just going to unplug the two little red wires. And on this thing, it doesn't matter. It's a switch. It's basically a switch which is closed circuit. And then at high temperatures, it goes open circuit. So basically what it does, inside there's a little bellows. And as that bellows expands, as it goes over a temperature, and these are actually 105 degree. Most vaccines, it's 105 degree, the overheat stat. So once it goes over 105, it'll go open. So it could have done that, and then it's not reset itself. It should be an automatic reset. There's no manual reset buttons on there. We don't need to push it. Some overheats have got manual reset buttons. So just look out for those, because you might have two overheats in series. The 105, the Baxi 105 range, the Potterton Performer 28s and 30s, the HE ranges, they had two overheats. They had one on the pipe measuring the temperature and they had one up on the, uh, on the flue measuring that and they were wired in series, they wired through each other. And the flue ones had a manual reset, a little red button. And I've had guys looking through, changing circuit boards and not realising that that was a fault. So that's something else. So we're just going to get the multimeter and then we're going to check across it. So I've just got it set on two ohms. And I'm just going to go across the two connections. And it doesn't matter which way I go, I'm measuring a switch. So one onto one connection, one onto the other. And if I look across at the multimeter, I've got OL, well, open line, open circuit. There's no connection across there. So obviously something's gone awry, it's open circuit. So when the boiler's going through its cycle, it gets that demand, it's looking for continuity through there, 
to make sure that it's not going to cause any problems. That's why it's going to that overheat, that, that, that overheat lockout, the E110. The reason that the customer complained that the boiler was running all the time, what's happened is that the pump was running constantly. Because it's got that open circuit, the circuit board realises that and it was trying to run the pump to try to cool itself down, hoping that the temperature would come down below 105 degrees and make that reset. So that was a bit of a telltale, that pump running constantly. Obviously, we're doing these videos for guys that might not be as experienced. That's why I went through all the tests. As a, an, an experienced engineer, I would have probably gone straight to that overheat stack, but I wanted to go through the sequence of operation of how you would trace it. It's no good me jumping in. As I talk about when I treat, teach fault find, it's all about baby steps, getting used to the baby steps. Once you've got used to the crawling and the baby steps, then you can jump ahead a little bit because if you jump ahead too quickly, you can miss something out really important and that causes you problems. You're starting putting expensive components in when really you only need to put a cheaper, an overheat stack's probably gonna be five or six quid. So the next stage is whip that overheat, put the new overheat stack in, and then we'll cut we'll come back from that. Right, so we've got we've got a new overheat stack. So the first thing I'm gonna do before I put it in, I know it's a brand new component, but in the past I put new stuff in, it's not worked, so I'm gonna test it. Before I do, I wanna test what resistance I've got in my leads. Some leads have got fuses in, so they can have um, one 1 1.2 ohms resistance in the leads. Now in the uh, fault finding guide it said if it was any more than 1.5 ohms, so if I had like say 1.3 in the leads and 0.2 in that, it's going to give me a false reading. So I'm just going to check my leads. So I put the two connections together and if I check the multimeter, I've got between 0 0.1, 0 0.2, it's just jumping up between those two. So the next thing, I'm just going to check across the overheat stat. So I've gone across the overheat stat and the reading I'm getting on there is 0 0.1. So that's fine, I've got a really good connection. The reason it was jumping a little bit when I was touching it, I'm not getting a real perfect connection on there, but when I test it across, yep, yeah, I'm on there, I'm getting that 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So in effect, it's showing that there's no resistance at all in there. So I can now swap that out. So I'm just gonna drop the front down, just, Swap it over, so I'm just going to remove the screws. So they're only tiny screws, just be careful you don't drop them in. So I'll start undoing the second screw, get me handy, and I'll just ease that thermostat out. So hopefully when it comes out, I've got the screw, oh, I'll drop the screw down. So I've got the second screw. That's just sitting in there. So we've got the overheat stats, that's the faulty one. So we've got the new one. And the easiest way, pop the screw through the little hole, pop it in, and then just line the hole up. Now we could have made life a little bit easier by removing the, the left-hand side panel, but these boilers were designed to change components without removing the side panel. So we've tightened that up, but not overly tight. We've still got a little bit of movement on, on that, just so we can then line it up. So I'll just turn the tank around, so I'll tighten that up. Now, that, this particular overheat stack didn't have any heat transfer paste on. Um, some manufacturers put heat transfer paste, some don't put heat transfer paste. If they don't put heat transfer paste on, don't bother putting any on. But if you did put any on, it doesn't make a great deal of difference. It's there to help transfer the heat. Um, so if you use it, that's fine. If the manufacturers haven't put any on, don't use it. Um, don't put any on. But it's always worth carrying some, just in case you need some. So I've swapped that over. The two connections, it doesn't matter which way you're putting, it, putting them on. It's a switch. At the end of the day, it's make or break. But they lend themselves to go on that way, so once we've got it on that way, we can then pop the cover back up, pop the fuse back in, turn the power back on, and we've got a little bit of communication, the front screen's come up and the boiler's just going through a self-check, 
So we're going to turn the hot tap on, see if it's working. So we've got both thermostats up to maximum. So we're just going to turn the hot tap on. So again, the tap symbol's flashing. We know we've got a demand. So we've now let the little flame symbols come on and we're up and running. So we'll give it a minute or two just to warm up, just to start getting up to temperature. We can see now, we can hear that the boiler's ramping up onto high. So we know that we're going to get hot water. So that's the flow temperature in there. So we know that we're starting to come through. I'll just whip my glove off. Yeah, the water's nice and warm, so I'm going to turn that off. So the next thing is put a demand on for the central heating. So again, all I need to do, I'm on off on the control on this combi pack for, so I'm just going to push the manual button. So we'll get the little communication, the little green lights come on to say we're communicating. The radiator symbol's flashing. So now the diverter will be moving across onto heating mode, opening up to let water around the circuit. The flames come on, and again, we should be modulating up. It probably won't go on to full rate yet, because it's just come on, it will gradually rise up. Most modern boilers tend to go on full rate for hot water, providing your flow rate's good enough. And on central heating, they'll come on on a lower rate, they'll judge the differential between flow and return, and then they'll start to ramp up, dependent on what's required to warm that system up. So, that's another fault that we've found. We've cured the problem. It was a simple overheat issue. We didn't go in too deep. We tested it. We didn't change expensive parts. Hopefully, again, those hints and tips that I've given you today will stand you in good stead for when you go out there fault finding. Some of you guys that are experienced, you probably knew a lot of this, but we're aiming these videos at the guys that are trying to get into fault finding. They're starting on that journey of fault finding careers. So, all the mistakes that me and Alan have made over the years, other people have made, we're trying to help people not make those mistakes. So, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you have, give us a thumbs up, give us a like. If there's any other videos you'd like us to do, please get in touch with us. Let us know what you want us to try and do. We'll try and cover as much of, of that as, you, as we can. So until next time, it's been Roy Fugler at the Beaver Training Academy over in Halifax saying thanks very much for watching. Bye bye. Thank you very much for that, Roy. And, and once again, thank you to Viva Training Academy for all effort and um, time and effort that you're putting into helping new trainees and new recruits across the UK, really. If you are interested in further fault finding training, as I've said previously now, um, Viva Viva's offering boiler fault finding uh, training courses now as well. So please get in touch with them. If you want us to do any more on video, then again, put some comments below. Let us know what type of videos you'd like us to do and, and we'll try as best to accommodate you as much as we can. So yeah, um, if you can, please, please put a thumbs up, please like, share, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And thanks for watching.